Hello, everyone. This is my first time in Stockholm, so thank you very much for the, the welcome here. It's been great. Uh, my name is Amber Case. I'm a research fellow at the Harvard Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. We study internet and society, and I'm also at Media Lab. Uh, I did a startup in 2010 and sold it in 2012, so I'm still recovering from the choosing which 100 hours a week you want to work when you have the freedom of doing a startup. But today I'd like to talk about uh, a bit about AI, a bit about this thing called calm technology, and a bit about the subject that I like to study called cyborg anthropology. A traditional anthropologist goes out into the world and studies the strange kinship rituals that people have and the tools that they use. A cyborg anthropologist looks at themselves. They look at the fact that they wake up next to phones in the morning, that these devices cry and you have to pick them up and soothe them back to sleep, that they get hungry and you have to feed them, and that if you don't upgrade them, they turn against you and make you look dumb. But cyborg anthropology is about studying the interaction between humans and computers and how technology changes culture. And when I was writing my thesis on mobile phones in 2007, when the iPhone came out, I was walking around in San Francisco looking at people tapping on pieces of glass and wondering how that would influence us in the future. Well, there's this quote that 50 billion devices will be online by 2020. I don't know whether I believe in this quote or not. This, this quote usually comes out every so often. It's a nice big number. Usually it's because companies that make chips need to increase their market share. And when they put chips into phones, it meant that lots of phones could sell. And now we need to put chips into more things. So then the Internet of Things became this hot topic item. Every time I see this quote, that this many billion devices will be online. I like to ask whether this actually sounds good or not. Let's consider the devices that we already have in our lives and the notifications that we have. Consider the, uh, the smart watch that when you first get it, you have to get rid of a lot of the notifications that go on it. Because it turns out, how many of you have notifications that you like all of the time? Do you like all the notifications you get? There's one person, you are very lucky. Um, you must have a good relationship with the notifications. A lot of our notifications are not essential. They're, they're roboticized, they're automated. A lot of them are not even from humans. A lot of them mean nothing. And yet our attention keeps getting distracted back and forth out of our real environment. Or we could look at the smart fridge. There are so many companies that want me to build them a smart fridge for some reason. And it's always like this. The smart fridge will know what's in your refrigerator using machine vision, and it will get it wrong most of the time. Uh, you have to have a lot of good lighting inside your fridge. If you put in a foreign object in a different language, it needs to be able to translate that. It'll get it really wrong, and then it will tell you when you're on the way to the store, which means privacy violation for your location, uh, to get milk and eggs. But I don't know about you, but unless I'm lactose intolerant, I will always pick up milk and eggs at the store. I don't need a $5 million venture-backed startup to tell me that I need milk and eggs or to tell me that the bananas have gone bad. Bananas change color when they're bad. I don't need a smart chip to tell me that sort of thing. In the meantime, if you put all of these together, uh, they're all written in different programming languages, they have different update cycles, they have a, a whole new surface area for security vulnerabilities, and they can all go out of business at any point in time without any consumer protection. You get what I like to call the dystopian kitchen of the future, in which everything is calling your attention. Nothing really works together. You have to download the latest virus update to make sure you can open your fridge because you could infect your washing machine. Is this really the future that we want? And I know many of you have technology that's better than this, uh, but a lot of times this fails and we have suboptimal conditions. When we build technology for fun, or when we build it entirely on the web, it's fine. It's funny if Twitter goes down. But if you have a pacemaker installed on you and that goes down, it's a matter of life and death. And so we can't build things the same way that we build for the web when technology gets closer and closer to us in our everyday lives. This is my favorite startup, PetNet. PetNet.io said, we're going to make it so that you can remotely feed your pets uh, we will give them kibble and water on a regularly scheduled basis. And we're connected to the cloud so you can Skype your animals if you want and see them when you're gone. And everybody thought this was great. 20 years ago, we had this. With an X10 controller, you could make your own scheduling system for, for pet feeding. So of course what happened is this was connected to a remote server. The server went down and a bunch of these pets starved. 
and people didn't know whether their pets were going to be okay or not. They had to break into their house to get the pets out. So then I looked and I said, well, the pet net promised that the pets would be safe, right? Uh, but then I looked in the terms of service and it says pet net is not held responsible for any service failures and you agree to not hold us liable if your pets die. Do not use this, let's see. You agree that you will not rely on the services for any safety or critical purposes related to you or your pet. Are you kidding me? This is impossible. Yet in the beginning it said never worry about this again. So I tweeted at them and I said, do you have offline support? Obviously, this is the first thing that you should have done, offline support, so that you guarantee that you still have the scheduling system working when the server goes down. And they said, oh yeah, that was on our, that was on our task list. <laughs> so we have this era of interruptive technology. It's not interruptive in just cloud and you know, remote mainframe, but, uh, or just battery life or signal any of these things can go out at any point in time. Everything is interruptive. Technology is interrupting us. The server is going down. We're having security issues. And what's the opposite of this? I was trying to look for people that had written about this before the time of Internet of Things. And I actually found from the creators of ubiquitous computing and a lot of early IoT thinkers this phrase called calm technology. And this kind of stopped me when I was writing my thesis. I got really excited about it because it was written about in the 90s at Xerox Park. And Mark Weiser, who is no longer around to talk about this, was one of the people who came up with ubiqu ubiquitous computing, and also John Seeley Brown. And they wrote a bunch of papers about what would happen when the number of devices outnumbered people, when instead of us sharing all of us sharing one computer, one mainframe, and scheduling time on it. What happened when many devices would share many, each of us? So there was a number of papers that they wrote. One is called The Coming Age of Calm Technology, which was about that exact thing. And one of the other papers they wrote was, the world is not a desktop. We can't design software as if we were still in the desktop era. The desktop era means that you have something plugged into a wall, you have a relatively reasonable screen real estate, you have, uh, you have reasonable connectivity, you can have these expectations about the quality and the reliability and the uptime of your software. Most of the time because you would just put it on a CD-ROM and that thing would last for two years and everybody would just be printing something out and they were still faxing something. But now we're in an era in which things are not very optimal. We're on mobile phones in a kind of dial-up era. Everything is incredibly slow. So how do we make our software work really, really well when the conditions are horrible and could go away at any point in time? A lot of people throw quotes around about invisible technology, but this is one of the original quotes on invisible computing, and it's that a good tool is invisible, and by invisible, we, we don't mean that the tech is actually invisible, but we mean that it doesn't intrude on your consciousness. You just focus on the task and not the tool. And what does this mean? Well, a book, when it's well-written, you dissolve into it. You don't even notice that you're there anymore. If you're a carpenter, you don't really notice the tools you're working with when you're in a state of flow. You just dissolve into it. Or electricity. Electricity is there when we need it. We don't notice it when it's not. We notice if it goes out. Can you imagine Wi-Fi being as wonderful as electricity is, that it would be up all the time? Or electricity being horrible like Wi-Fi? You would have the lights in here go out half the time, and you'd have to pair your computer somehow to the electricity to get it to work. We were given these guarantees and these killer apps, appliances in the home, with the era of electricity, and now we think we can build these killer apps for Wi-Fi and network connectivity that is just not as stable. So how do we design a calm technology? How do we make things that are calm? Um, from some of these research papers, I've, I've gotten a few of these principles and added a few more. First is that technology shouldn't require all of our attention, just some of it, and only when necessary. How do you do that? One of the examples that they gave is the tea kettle. The tea kettle, you set it, you forget it, it calls to you when it's ready, you can be in another room. It's pretty straightforward. But there's more to this than that, and one is that technology should be able to empower your peripheral attention. We have so much information available, so much high-resolution information available right in front of us. Our primary attention 
allows us to be really attuned to something. And that was the desktop era. All of our primary attention was right here. If you look at how a car is built, everything about that car is about s supporting our primary attention, getting us to calculate where the cars are when they're going by. And we have our secondary and tertiary attention with the rear view mirror, we have the, the uh, stick shift, if you're driving a stick shift, we have pedals that you don't even have to look at, you use your feet, it's a haptic feedback system, we have radio buttons. This is a whole elegant system designed for this, especially street lights. You can barely glance at them and understand because they're just a symbol, they're just a very simple light that changes. The minute you put your iPhone up in front of you or your Android phone, all of your primary focus dumps out and goes right into this device because it's built not to take advantage of your peripheral attention, it's built to just take all of your attention. It's a mini desktop computer in your pocket. So how do we empower your peripheral attention? If this is very high resolution, the sense of touch, the sense of hearing, the sense of sight in your peripheral attention is lower resolution, but you can compress the information that you want to give to somebody into a smaller resolution and make somebody attuned to that in their peripheral attention. And a lot of really clever people do this. Here's, here's a silly example, though. This is the Luma Back Smart Posture Sensor. It just buzzes you when you're slouching. Um, people use this as kind of like little brother technology. It watches you to make sure that you can change your behavior. Uh, but there's a few other things as well. For instance, I had an employee that had an insulin pump installed. And he was really excited to get this insulin pump because he thought he would be a normal human. He would be a cyborg, but it would not be very noticeable. And instead of having to do insulin injections all the time, he would have this automatic regulation system. So we have a meeting, and he starts beeping during the meeting. And I said, why are you beeping? Is this the insulin pump? And he said, yeah. I said, can you turn it off? Can you turn off the beeping? And he said, no. I went through this entire surgery to get this installed, and I can't change the notification style at all. Because this device was made for somebody in an assisted care home so that the assistant could hear the noise and refill the insulin pump. This means that when he goes to movies or weddings or funerals, he beeps, and everyone turns around to him, and they look, and they think that he's on his phone. The whole point of this, to be a normal human, to not be noticeable, to be an invisible cyborg, was thrown out the window. And then when he's in a really loud concert, he can't hear it, and so he'll miss filling the insulin. He could die because of this. So when in doubt, allow somebody to change the alert style. Because if it was just a haptic buzz, he would be able to hear it, feel it, but nobody else would. It's a personal alert, it should be haptics. So this is, this is just one example of how difficult it is to predict what context somebody's going to be in, but allowing someone the flexibility changes it because it allows them to deal with it. A lot of AI assumes something on behalf of the user allowing somebody to change that and see how it's thinking can make a much better user experience for people. Technology should inform and in calm. How do you give somebody information in a calm way? Have you ever seen these ads? I won't say which company, but there's usually ads where there's a perfect condo, and there's usually a guy from San Francisco. He wakes up in the morning. He has a perfect San Francisco accent, so the AI understands him every single time, the first thing he says. With, he never has to say anything twice, which only works in films. Um, but then a disembodied computer voice wakes him up and says, Good morning, Dave. This is the weather forecast for today, and goes on for like 20 minutes. And you see this person in their perfect condo speak back and forth to the AI. There's no trucks driving by. There's no extra sounds. The perfect utopian environment. Everything is really glossy and shiny. I want to see the opposite ad. I want to see somebody trying to deal with their voice-activated interface while they're walking down the street, and a train is going by, and they have a slight polished, like, sort of like accent or something. And then the horrible things happen and everything breaks down. Like that's really what the future is like. It's a kind of mild dystopia. So my old co-founder and I were talking about this and we just made a light. We said, what if you compress all the information about the weather into a light? The light will glow the color of the weather and when it's going to be. So we took a, a hue light bulb and we just changed the color. Now, I lived in Portland, Oregon at the time and it's usually gray. So the, the light was usually white or blue for rain. And I'd wake up and I'd go into the kitchen in the morning, I'd be like, oh, it's gonna rain again, or oh, it's gonna be foggy. But this morning, it was yellow, and I was so excited. The whole time, it was never trying to take my attention away. It just gave me ambient awareness of what was going on in my environment. 
And then if I wanted higher resolution information, I could look at the iPad that we installed on the wall with the weather report. You can always get that. I saw two implementations of the same thing. First, at one of the startups that I joined when I was out of college, the entire engineering department just had three strings of lights. It was red if the server was down, yellow if there was an issue with the server or the database was full, or green if everything was OK. And that stretched around the engineering department. Everybody had this ambient awareness of the server status the entire time, and it was totally OK when it went red for everybody to go to battle stations. This is very Star Trek-like. And I like Star Trek, so. Um, but the other issue was that this is, this is possible to do on, uh, for an entire server facility. We were moving into a, a new building, and I, I was trying to find the, the server facility that had the, the best uptime in Portland, Oregon. So we finally go downtown, and it's the fourth floor of this building, and we go and we open the office, and there's just this guy sitting there in loafers on a leather sofa with his old hunting dog, and he's in his 70s. And there's no technology anywhere except for an iPad on the wall. I said, well, what are you doing? He said, well, there's servers on this entire floor. You just can't see them. It's a city block full of servers. But I don't have to go in there except for once a week, maybe twice a week, uh, sometimes once a month, because he got all of the information of the server status down and, and winnowed out all of the different parts that could fail. And all he has is a screen that shows green, uh, yellow, or red. And whenever it shows yellow, he opens up the door, he hears all of the very noisy servers, and he's put LEDs on all the machines, and he just looks for the one that has the yellow LED, and he goes and fixes it, and he goes right back and hangs out and reads magazines and books. And that's his life, and he's been doing this for a long time. 99.97 uptime for this guy, pretty good. Um, most of the big companies in Portland use this server facility. And I love this because he just was sitting there with his grin on his face saying, look, it doesn't need to be that complex. I just sit here and think about how I can remove all the excess, and then I have a pretty reasonable life after. This was the original promise of technology, right? That we would get more free time, not less. That we'd, our lives would be easier. Yet media and technology like a gas or like cigarettes, it kind of expands to fill all of our available space. When was the last time you were bored? When was the last time you reflected on what was going on? When was the last time you looked at all the photos you took in the last month and decided to print some of them out? How many of these things will actually exist uh, if there's like a dark age for data? An issue with a lot of technology that's built is it's informed by film. We see Terminator and Robocop, which are usually enhanced military objects, and we see perfect uh, interaction verbally with a computer. Now, a lot of this came from Rossum's Universal Robots and a lot of, a lot of this really old media where it, became, it, it came from agricultural revolution to industrial revolution and it was man versus machine. But if you want to put on a stage play of man versus machine, then you make a machine that looks like a human and then we got robots and cyborgs and now we expect that these things should be shaped like humans. Yet every time we use Google, we're interacting with so many bots. They don't need to be shaped like anything. They just work. And so every time somebody, a lot of these companies try to make these bots that look like humans, they end up being horrible. We have this expectation when something speaks at us like it's a human that we can speak back to it at the same level. Why not have a kind of machine language that's tonal or silly? There's a reason why so many people like R2-D2 over C-3PO. C-3PO might know two million languages, but he's annoying in all of the languages. R2-D2 is adorable, and there's one language, it's tonal. You know exactly whether R2-D2 is really upset or really happy. It's, it's pretty universal. And in Pixar films, you see this too. In the beginning of the Pixar film, there's usually just a very, there's no script. Um, if we want to make AIs and voice interfaces and things that give us a good experience, we could think of how much can we do without voice? Because the minute you put voice in, you have user expectations, and you have to translate it into all these different languages. You're set up for a complete failure most of the time, unless you're really, really clever. And oftentimes, it puts humans on pause. With a voice-activated interface, you might have to say something again and again and again to get the computer to recognize it. People talk about the future of, of interaction with your hands like these magic leap type interfaces. And I've seen this happen 10 years ago and 20 years ago with 
lots of funding every single time. But then I asked people, would you ever want to play Mario Brothers with a hand gesture interface? Somebody walks behind you and then Mario falls off the cliff? Or a voice activated interface, Mario jump, Mario jump, and then a dog behind you barks and then Mario jumps and you fall off the cliff again? It's not for everything. There, there will never be one interaction style that takes over the entire world. It's all contextual base. Google's interesting because it gives you, it's basically a human switchboard. They took out the I'm feeling lucky button because you're not usually lucky when the AI decides, <laughs> when the AI decides uh, what to give you as a result. Um, but instead, you make the choice. So as long as an AI is working alongside you, narrow AIs, so to speak, then you can at least make an informed decision because you're bringing your context to it. So it's this kind of 50-50 symbiotic interaction. It's doing what it's good at, you're doing what you're good at, you can kind of meet in the middle. It's humans and computers working alongside each other instead of some perfect system that exists outside of human context and breaks down in some awful way. This is my friend Todd Huffman, and about six years ago he said, I'm really sick of seeing these biology PhDs scan two-dimensional tissue samples. It takes them so long, they have repetitive stress in their hands, and they have to categorize them and do manual data entry. I'm going to make a, a robot that takes a three-dimensional tissue and uses a diamond knife to cut it and then scans it at the same time, and then we can do this 15 times faster than a human, and then we'll make a feedback loop where a doctor will say, this became cancer. Uh, this wasn't cancer. This was the type of cancer. This is how many months it took for the cancer. And that feedback loop between human and computer uh, will end up being far more accurate than just a computer AI perfect system alone, which is usually only in the films, or a single doctor. And this point was taking something that was really annoying for people to do, freeing them up to do more cancer research. Uh, and then this is just something that is 250,000 or so USD that you can just have now and scan these tissues. I want to see this happen more and more because it's not trying to do something so perfect in an AI outside of the world, and it's not trying to make humans do everything. It's what's, what's annoying, and how do we maintain this system? How do you make something that's really simple, easy to maintain, that you ship it and it's not really a big deal, uses off-the-shelf components? Technology can communicate, but it doesn't need to speak. Uh, this is an early project from Natalie Jermanjenko at Xerox Park. So I should explain a little bit more about Xerox Park. Xerox Park was a research and development anomaly that came out of Xerox, the printing company. But Xerox Park was the Palo Alto Research Center was strange because it had all these artists and anthropologists and dreamers about the future of interaction with technology. People sat in beanbag chairs to talk about code. And they sat in beanbag chairs because Alan Kay and others found that if you're sitting in a regular chair as an engineer and another engineer is writing on the board, you will probably interrupt that engineer really fast with whatever you have to say. But if everybody sits in beanbag chairs, it takes a really long time to get out of the beanbag chairs. So it's more likely that somebody will be able to get out uh, and so, so slowly that someone will finish their idea. So it was a kind of automated, calm technology in a way. But this idea, uh, there, were, there were all these ideas that came out of Xerox Park. The modern graphic user interface that Steve Jobs took out of there. There was also, the, there was also Ethernet. There were all these amazing inventions from the 70s to the 90s. Uh, there's a lot that's in there that people haven't taken out yet, which is why I was so excited to find Calm Technology. But this dangling string was just a piece of plastic uh, on a servo motor installed in the ceiling, and it was connected to the local network. So whenever somebody was doing something interesting on the local network, this thing would whir around and make a lot of noise. People would go out of their offices, look at it, find where the person was that was doing something interesting, and they would all go into their office and social network with each other. Uh, of course, people had these active park badges that would track their location all through the building. I think probably even in places you don't want to track. But uh, you could actually see on these bulletin boards that where people were, and you could see where people were gathering. So instead of just having an office environment where sometimes people have a birthday and that's the only time you interact with other teams, people across teams would be interacting all of the time. It was a really simple way of doing something. The Roomba is one of my favorite pieces of technology. It's not very good. It doesn't clean corners, uh, but people love it. And it's great because it makes this noise. It goes da 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 when it's done, and it goes dun dun when it's stuck. And when it's stuck, you're like, oh no, the Roomba, I have to help it. Uh, this is opposite of how we think about 
uh, robots. We think about robots in a way that we, um, I guess in a way that, that they're always better than us, but in, in saying that robots will never be better than us and actually making a robot that's worse than us means that we can take care of it, kind of like those Tamagotchi pocket pets that people used to have. They were adorable because we had to care for them. And the Roomba isn't very good and we have to care for it, and so it's beloved. Cats ride around it on YouTube videos. It, but it has this tonal language and has a backup light. It's either green and it's okay, or it's orange and you have to clean it. And that's it, you maintain the vacuum, it's really simple to do even though it's not a very good vacuum. So I would like to see more technology like this that's, that's clever. And I think one of the founders of it, Helen Granier, just didn't want a vacuum, because she was at MIT, I guess she was busy. Uh, so she went and tried to get some funding, and they said, why don't you make a really big version of this first to detect mines and minefields? So she makes this giant Roomba that goes around the landscape and explodes every once in a while. And, and <laughs> until the supply chain was good enough that you, she could shrink it down. I think that's the story of Roomba, so. And technology should consider social norms. Uh, how many of you, no one is wearing Google Glass. Who even remembers Google Glass? This was, a big, this was a big failure, but we can go and look at why it was a failure. 15 years ago, we had flip phones, we had these dumb phones, and then cameras showed up in them, and we got really panicked. There were all these articles about how it was terrible to have a camera phone uh, because privacy was dead. But after a while, we got used to having these camera phones. We know that when you hold a phone up like this, you're taking a photo, you can duck out of the way, that most people are using it just to take a picture of their food. It's kind of pre-digestive ritual before they eat. It's not really that exciting what people are using them for. It's very mundane. In fact, most people are pretty boring, and that's okay. Uh, but what, what we had happen with it is that it's not that technology isn't ready for us. It's that we're usually the ones that aren't ready for technology. And so if you try to release something with 20 different features that no one's ever seen before, they'll most likely focus on the scariest one, and they'll reject the whole thing outright. Uh, especially journalists. They'll get really upset, and they'll sensationalize the story and now to get ad revenue. So you have to look at where it is. And it took having a landline phone, and then a cordless phone, and then the cordless phone being untethered from the house to be a cell phone, and then a camera to go on the cell phone, and then the iPhone. It took this entire journey to get people used to this technology in their pockets. That, that was many, many decades. It's kind of like when elevators first came out. They had to be artificially slowed down so that people could deal with them. They, weren't, they uh, had never been accelerated in that direction before. They were terrified. And there were a bunch of people who would push buttons on the elevators for you, these elevator operators union, that said people cannot press their own buttons on elevators. They went on strike once, and then we figured out we could press the buttons ourselves. That's why we don't have elevator operators anymore. But it's always these confusing things. It's, ooh, it's new technology and it's terrifying. But it's always a social thing you have to look at. Where is the social norm? How do you change the social norm? How long will it take? I think people have about half a year to a year to absorb a new feature. If it's really new, it takes more time than that, which is why you have early adopters that pay a lot of money for non-functioning things. Anything below that norm line, because we all have phones with cameras in our pockets now, anything below that is restorative technology. It restores you to the norm. So glasses, for instance, they restore you to 20-20 vision, and they're considered decorative or restorative, and they're, they're okay. We don't look at somebody with glasses and say, oh no, I'm terrified. But we do when somebody wears Google Glass or has a military bionic leg that can shoot lasers because it's enhancing you above the norm, and whatever that norm is. If everybody had bionic legs with lasers or lightsabers or something like that, it wouldn't be terrifying. Everybody would have that equal power. So when Google Glass came out, it did 20 new things that nobody had ever used before, which is putting something right on your face, uh, having text messaging, video camera, uh, all of these different things. And the news just focused on the thing they thought was scariest, which is persistent video recording forever. There was no calm technology light on the front that shone red when you're recording, so it was ambiguous. Nobody could tell whether you were recording or not. And not to mention that it, you have five minutes of battery life if you do want to record with that thing, and then your head heats up, and then you have to take the thing off, and it's awful, and you have a headache for three days. But you can't explain that. That doesn't sell newspapers. So this, this was why that failed. If they wanted to make it work, they could have taken an Apple 
approach. They could have taken 20 years and very slowly made something that added additional features for years, and it's very boring, so, oh, let's just do it all at once. The right amount is the minimum to solve the problem. We're going to have issues in the future, we're already having them right now, about complexity. We're going to inherit a future that we don't know all the abstraction layers that somebody left before. We have programmers that are going in, learning some exciting language, leaving without any documentation, and then we have to clean up the mess. And this happens all over the place. So how do we make sure that we have something that's maintainable and understandable for a long time? I like to think about what's the least amount of tech you can use to solve the problem and no more. Uh, and I like to think of these, these are really simple and boring, but these are some of my favorite technologies. This is a street light, and it just changes color when you need to go or stop. It's like punctuation for your life. And there's the toilet occupied sign on the plane. Again, you don't need to translate that into any language. Or think about escalators. When they fail, they turn into stairs. It's okay. Like, it's not terrible. Um, and they're pretty complicated, but when they do fail, you can still use them. Uh, when an elevator fails, it's pretty difficult to use it. Technology should make use of the near and the far. How many of you, on airplane mode, on your phone, how many apps can you actually use? Whereas when we were in the desktop era, you could use everything on your computer before the internet. So the question is, as the scarce resource in the 21st century becomes attention and not technology, becomes bandwidth, becomes battery life, how do we do well with less? What can you do on the device? How much can you calculate, compute, store on the device so that you barely have to touch the network and you, can only, you only touch the network at the briefest of moments? Because somehow we upgraded the whole electrical grid and we don't have major outages with that, but we, but we haven't upgraded bandwidth, we haven't upgraded connectivity, and yet we're supposed to have more and more apps and more and more devices and rely on it so much. How do we work with less? Um, I would like to propose this kind of graph for what I think could happen with computing, or rather what I want to happen with computing. We have computing that's really far away from you with mainframes. Bill Gates sneaking out of his house at three in the morning to use some of the timeshare that he got on the mainframe. Then we had computing come close to us. Instead of many people per one mainframe, we had maybe one-to-one -one or three people in a home sharing a desktop. And maybe if how you learned how to program was from a magazine typing the the programming into the computer on your parents' desktop for three hours at a time, and the rest of the time thinking about what you were going to do when you got back on that computer. Like, that's a really, it was a really special time. But then we got into kind of a cloud situation where we're processing everything away from us. I really wanted to go to where the Facebook photos are stored um, in, in Oregon. There's a lot stored in Oregon on hydroelectric power, and I just want to go to the server facility and ask for my photos and say, can I have all my photos? I know they're in there. They're mine, right? Can I just walk down the aisles of servers? And of course, they're not going to do that. Um, but the question is, if you're storing all of the sensitive information away from you, how can companies both be security experts and provide their core service at the same time? If you stored all the information with you on your device, encrypted on your, wherever you were storing it, personal database, then uh, whenever you wanted to do something, like if you went to a doctor, you could say, I'm sharing my health data with you for two hours for the purpose of getting an update in health information. They would provide their procedures, you would get that data stored back to your own server, because your phone is powerful enough to be a server at this point, and then you would get that stored with you, and you would release all your information from that server, and it wouldn't be stored there. And if somebody hacked that server then, they would only get access to what was shared in the last two hours. They wouldn't get this monolithic, giant thing. The thing is, all of these exciting new, giant cloud store database things uh, are just hacking targets. Everything will be hacked. How do we n avoid a Titanic-like scenario in the future? Um, and how do we go back to a more distributed computing era? It's interesting to look at stuff like IPFS, to look at lower bandwidth programming languages, to look at weird server architectures. I would encourage you to think of these things because we're going to have a crisis in bandwidth. We're going to have a crisis in what we're doing. And we can't just keep putting more and more computing power into our phones because batteries are, are on the verge of exploding at this point, um, and there's only so far that we can go. So we have to be more and more clever. I would love to see people as clever as 1980s video game 
computer programmers, the, the, the amount of sprites and where things were stored and how memory was used was super inspiring. Uh, and now we're in this big era of bloat where we think we have endless resources and we don't. Um, so hopefully we'll start to go back to that so that every time, like when I install an update on my phone, I want the update to be smaller than it was before, not larger than it was before. Uh, it's hard to convince executives to do this because we're all in a rush. But the more you rush, the more you'll become like petnet.io. A lot of pets and animals and humans will die in the process. We can prevent that before that happens, uh, hopefully. So if you process as much as possible on the device itself, you'll have less server costs, you'll have better user experience, you'll have a better, uh, better uh, quality for everybody, because you'll have to think so much about what's the least you can do to get the thing done. It's, it's hard to do and it's hard to take the time. But we're in Sweden, and this is a great place to start, I think, I'm hoping. Um, so if good design allows you to accomplish your goals in the least amount of moves, and you're supposed to take things away until there's nothing left to take away in good design, then Calm Technology does the same thing, but you can accomplish your goals with the least amount of mental cost. And how do you offload some of that complexity? So instead of having smarter computers, we can have smarter humans. How can we work in a future in which the scarcest resource is attention and not technology? Because a lot of people don't want to compute as their primary focus. They want to be human. Who wants to automate playing with kids? Who wants to automate falling in love? I mean, some people do. But at the end of the day, wasn't the promise of technology to give us back our free time, our reflective time, to give us back our humanity? If we're going to talk about robot rights, we should talk about human rights first. It's OK to want to go to sleep. It's OK to want to eat. It's OK to take a break on a Netflix binge. We have to give ourselves a little more credit as humans, because what we bring culturally to these systems will be the thing that's unautomatable. And again, from the Mark Weiser quote, scarce resource won't be technology. It will be our attention. And how technology works with that attention will make or break it. I got really excited about this, so I wrote a book on it. And then I got excited about sound, uh, because there are so many obnoxious alerts out there. So I'm writing a book on sound design as well, so that we can make notifications that don't annoy you, especially as people move into smaller houses and they don't want a washer or dryer that just blares at them. Um, I put up the principles at calmtech.com, but more importantly, I put the research papers from Mark Weiser and John C. Lee Brown. These are beautiful papers. They're written in this way that everybody can read them from almost every profession and any background. And they were written in the 90s, and they're totally, they're, they're just, they read as if we're reading them today. It's incredible. Uh, I would really encourage you to check them out. Um, part of why I'm talking about this is Mark Weiser isn't around to talk about it. And I, I think it's not fair if somebody dies really young that they can't bring interesting information or even see the time in which their information is, is relevant. So thank you so much. Appreciate it.